morning. So it looks a little different today. Our worship team is all on vacation, including the sound people. <laughs> and so uh, I did learn I did learn enough just to turn the mics on this morning. So we do have mics. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna start with um, let's just pray. How about that? He's already here, but let's. We know that you are here with us. We know that you fill this building. We ask that you would fill each one of us. We pray that you would fill Bruce as he speaks. And as we interact with him, that um, all of our interactions and our words will be honoring and glorifying to you. We pray that you'll bless everyone that's not here today. Bless our worship team as they rest this week. And as they come back to fill us next week, we pray that you would fill them while they're on vacation. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So I'm going to start with the announcements. Um, Karen, are we doing children's church? You only have two kids. Do you want them to stay here, or are you going to take them back? Adrian said he'd like to come back. So oh, all right. Well, there we go. So as, as the, with, I'm going to finish the announcements, and then you guys can, you can go back with Karen. Uh, weekly events, we have Bible Blitz with Bruce on Monday night. That's tomorrow night. We're in Revelation not 10 he just he's yelling from the background i don't remember um i live with him so i just ask him when i do the announcements am i doing the right one men's revival group is saturday mornings and the sisters in christ is every day at eight o'clock in the morning and all those links are on our website in our text messages and next week is the family meal I goofed up, so we're going to do it at 11 o'clock because that's what I said. It should have been brunch week, and I messed, and I, I screwed it up. So we're going to go ahead and do um, the 11 o'clock, so we'll do it after service next week. And at 11.45 or whatever, whenever we get done with service, and the clipboard is here, and I'll pass it around if you guys could help fill it in. And next week, we are doing a panel discussion, Ooh. and it's me and Terry. And Dale, I think, I don't know. And possibly Sue. And possibly Sue. And so we're going to do a panel discussion next week. And then the following week, Rod Marquette's going to be with us from Destiny Church in Rochester. So we're excited about that. It's always good to have Pastor Rod in the house. And um, offering? Do we have anybody that will take offering? Somebody, will somebody grab the bags for me? And Matt, will you help? Dale? Um, we'll take offering. Y'all know how that works. We bless God. He blesses us. Um, if you don't have, if you don't put it in the offering bag, we have Venmo and PayPal and checks in the mail, text to give, all of those things. Y'all know the drill. Thank you, Lord. We love you. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for this offering. Thank you for blessing us so that we can bless others like the Onyx crew. And we are just so grateful for all the ways you bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Zadrian, you can go back with Karen. And Bruce Skinner, you're on. Call me by the last name, I'm in trouble. Well, it's my last name too, so. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so, a uh, little disclaimer today before we get going. This is a question and answer session about the Bible. So if you guys don't have any questions, guess who gets to ask questions? Uh-oh. If you don't ask questions, then ask some questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, before, so, while you guys are thinking, I'm going to have a little monologue for two hours. And then we can do question and answers after that. Uh, coming off of what Terry spoke about last week, you know, this is a, this is a new season for us, and we we do need we do need help. We've 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 lessened the load of our pastors so they can they can get their engine back going again. But three passages came to mind when I when I thought about that. Exodus chapter 17. The Amalekites were attacking Israel, and Moses said, "We're gonna we're gonna attack back, but I'm gonna be on top of the hill." And, and when my arms are raised, Israel will be victorious. But when my arms fall, Israel will not be victorious. And his arms started to fall. So two of his uh, helpers, her and uh, 
Joshua put rocks underneath his arms so he could always have his arms up. Then in the very next chapter, Moses was the judge over all of Israel. And his father-in-law said, now who has a good father-in-law with wisdom? There you go. Good, job. good job, Terry. <laughs> his father-in-law says, what are you doing? He says, well, God gave me all the commandments, and I'm here to judge Israel. He said, well, that's not a very good thing to do. Because you're in charge of the whole cramp of Israel, which is thousands and thousands of people, and he would be there morning to night judging matters between people and God. His father says, you can't do this because it's going to wear you out. So you need to elect or, or select people that are over 1,000, over 100, over 50, over 25, that then come ask the questions to them and not you. And then more serious matters, they will come to you. And then in Acts 6, uh, Peter was in the same situation. The disciples were growing, but the disciples back then in that time, the main job of the, the elders of the church were to take care of the widows. Because once the, once the husband died, the widows were really on their own. So the, the elders got, the elders, the apostles got weighed down serving the widows. And they said, this is not right because we can't even have time with God and pray and see a vision for the church if we're busy serving the, the widows, which was a good thing. Let's elect people just to serve the widows. So we're in, a, we're in a season where the elders of this church are serving you so that our senior elders can get their car fixed, get the house back in order. So they can come back stronger, and they will. So I gave you guys three minutes, question time. Anything in the Bible? Anything. And remember, I have a couple questions ready to go. Oh, Dave. Got anything, Dale? All right, so I was asked this question a couple weeks ago, and I thought it'd be a good one to, to start out with. When Jesus was on this earth, did he have to believe? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like what? When Jesus was on this earth, did he have to believe? Yeah. And the answer is yes. So, so expand on that answer. So my, my, my answer back was, well, which Jesus are we talking about? <laughs> no, was he talking about the Son of Man or the Son of God? Because the disciples asked Jesus, well, when's the end times coming? He says, I don't know. Because at that very point, he was the Son of Man and needed to rely on the Father's revelation to understand that. So yes, Jesus had to believe. He also had to be obedient. And he also had to go through everything that we went through. In Hebrews chapter 6, it says Jesus was tempted in all ways. And yet passed with flying colors. And what was being tested? Anybody? His humanity. His humanity, his will against the Father's will. Does Jesus, want to, does Jesus want to do it Jesus' way or does Jesus want to do it the Father's way? That was his test. Not which job to take. Not which road to take for the, for the, to, take, to get to Jericho, but what is my Father's will? So. I'm ready. Fire away. Uh oh Do we have two Bible blitzers or more in our class today, so it's, it's good? Four, five. We've got Dale and Sue, Terry. Wendy came from Minnesota to just be here to quiz the professor. And then, of course, there's my wife, who's always keeping the professor in line. <laughs> Anything. Anything that, that has always been troubling to you in your soul. Why don't the Jews believe that Jesus is God? Yeah. Okay, why don't the Jews believe why didn't the Jews believe that Jesus was God? Because they were looking for somebody Okay. They were looking for somebody different. 
<laughs> Excellent question because that because where I work we have rabbis come in. But they were so much by the for the Bible and the word of God. They were they were in charge of uh, they did prosper they were they and God did prosper them. But yet when their what's the best way to say this when their when their mindset changed away from serving God to serving themselves. God did say that there was a there was a, a a branch grafted into the root of Jesse, and that was that would be the church. But what happened? What happened to the Jewish? What happened to the Jews? They got comfortable in their own economy. I talked about this a couple weeks ago, where when Jesus came along, he was testing. He was. They didn't honor God with their hearts. They honored God with. They honored God by honoring people because they were more fearful of people than of God. Um, oh, Terry, go. What? No, I, I was going to ask too, Bruce, and, 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 and as you're going through, wouldn't, you know, correct me if I'm right or wrong, um, they were afraid of losing their authority. They didn't want to give up. They were leaders. And one of the big things is they did not they see him as a threat to their authority and how they were doing things and running things. Is that a fair statement? So, thanks for reminding me because I, I was, the train got off the tracks. They were, when Jesus, when Jesus came along to minister to them, and he, did, and he did, they just didn't like it. They, he was messing with their economy. He was messing with their, he was messing with their profession. He was messing with their religion even though he was the religion they were trying to worship. But they were, they wanted a Messiah to come along to take away the Roman rule. Because they were, they were being governed by the Romans. And they thought that this Messiah would bring the kingdom of heaven down to the earth and take away the Romans. So that the, so that the Jews could do what they wanted to do and, and serve God. But what they were doing was serving themselves because they had, they had, like Terry said, they had been, they had gotten themselves into a position where, come on in, they had gotten themselves in a the position where they didn't want to lose. How many, how many of us never want to lose what we have? You know, I've got a nice four hundred one k account. I don't want to lose that. I worked hard for that. I've got a good job. I've been at it for you know twenty five years. I've got good benefits. I don't want to lose that. I've got good kids. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to lose them by doing, you know, by letting them do something stupid. That all sounds good, but what we're doing is we're not putting our faith and trust in God who gave them to us. Terry. And then would a second thing be in, in answer? You know, is the verse I read. What the mic? because it's something familiar to me. Uh, you know, the verse I read last week where a prophet is not recognized in his hometown. The people, a lot of people looked at him, isn't he a carpenter's son? Isn't he just the son of Mary? And it was hard to them without being close to God or really accepting God's word or hearing God's word that he was actually the Messiah that came. They thought, looked at him, and so many people, uh, whether or not they believe, but uh, it, it, it made it, Simple for for the the Jews not to recognize him because a lot of people just looked at him as a common carpenter's son. So the problem lies. So, so they had a perception of who the Messiah was going to be. They had that already in their in their head. But then when Jesus comes along, like Terry said, he didn't start his ministry until he was thirty. So what did he do before his ministry started? He was a carpenter's son. Uh, in his house. And like they said, well, that can't be Messiah. He's Mary's son. What that tells me is that their perspective, their, their perception of who Jesus was going to be didn't match up with who he actually was. And they never accepted the Messiah because, well, he's not, he's not, he didn't come with royal robes on. He was born in a manger. And he wrapped him with swaddling clothes and it probably didn't smell too good there either. Is that how you? Is that how we think royalty should be entered into? I mean, you look at what happened in England when Queen Elizabeth died. 
I mean, that was nine months of, you know, pageantry and pomp, and they had to do things just right in order to coordinate. Uh, what, Charles III? I think he's officially called now. But they had a huge ceremony for him. Did, there was not a huge ceremony when Jesus was born. They had the wise guys coming from the east <laughs> and who gave him gifts. And the, 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 the current person in charge of Israel in Bethlehem, what did he want to do? Kill everybody two years and under. That way, that person can't become king and I lose my job then. See how easily things get <laughs> off track when we don't have the right perspective. Wendy. Um, I was going to say, well, I'm Wendy. I'm a grateful recovered addict. <laughs> Morning, Wendy. <laughs> usually at a few meetings. Um, so, um, so the Jews of the time, they were expecting a king on a stallion and an army, and Jesus came as a humble servant. On a donkey, yep, and entered the city. And and it, I like how you said it was because the Jewish people thought they were going to have to wipe out the Roman Empire and then put them on that pedestal all through man, human power yep. and not through God power. Yep. And when he came as a humble servant to wash feet, uh, pray with the thieves, the prostitutes, and the addicts, and the ones at the well who are blind and with the lepers, they're like, in their mindset, it was not what a king or the Messiah would do. So it was a mindset and a yeah. heart posture thing. It, it's what we've been. It's what it's it's it's, it's how we're taught and yeah. what we and what we think is right or not. And actually, he wrote a donkey that had never been written before, which is which is prophetic from the standpoint that that's a sign of royalty from the standpoint that donkey's never been written before. <coughs> and in the Bible, we've talked about this in Revelation. Uh, a, a stallion or a horse is a picture of war. And what did he ride? He rode a donkey, which is a picture of peace, peace and service. <laughs> so, and, and he went, and he was there to serve people, where we think a king is not going to, you know, he's not going to stoop to the level of serving his, his constituents, I guess is the best way to say it. But he was there to show us an example of how the kingdom of God works by washing people's feet, by sitting with the sinners, by, you know, you boil it all down, we're loving our neighbors. And that was one of the questions, one of the guys, one of the, one of the, one of the uh, Pharisees asked this is, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment of them all? Love the Lord God in all your heart, mind, soul, body, and love your neighbor as yourself. What if you live by yourself that's, you know, you don't have a neighbor for 10 miles? No, I have neighbors right here in this house that I need to love. Anybody who we come in contact with is our neighbor, so we need to love our neighbor as ourselves. Do we need help loving ourselves? <laughs> we don't do a very good job of that, so how can we do a very good job of loving our neighbors? But the first part of the commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Give it all to God. And he will give you the capacity to love the neighbors you really don't want to be with. Because at that point it becomes an act of God. Because what are one of some of the fruits of the Spirit? Galatians chapter 5. Love. Patience. Forbearance. Long-suffering. Peace. We, can't, we cannot produce enough love by ourselves, enough peace by ourselves, enough forgiveness by ourselves, long-suffering or patience by ourselves to love somebody who we find annoying and irritating. Here, let's, let's let it all out. <laughs> I have a quick question. I got a quick answer. It's been on my mind for a week. <laughs> Go ahead. Doesn't matter what time, what archaeology says. So the question arose, you know, they found the time. It's interesting. I've done some study on this, but uh, 
timeline says that Adam and Eve were approximately, according to the date, they were 9,000 years ago, and then they found stuff that was before that. We really don't know when time started, because what does Genesis 1 and 1 and 1 and 2 say? The earth was form without void and formless, but what was over the earth? Hovering. The Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God came down and took chaos and put it in order. So when God said, let there be light, there is no, there is no delay. God's word said light, there was light. As far as when that happened, it can be debated, it can be debated from now until eternity, and we still won't have an answer. And now we're distracted away from being who God was. Now we're bickering about when time started. What was that? Yeah, I mean that's it's it's and and God is above time. So when we try to think about how you know where we live forever, it blows this little infinite, this little finite mind. It cannot handle God's infinite, infinite. Well, I'm not going to say it, infantility. That's not even a word. Don't worry about that. But we can't we can't comprehend that, and and so that's why we need to rely on God to reveal things to us at the right time. Because a, a right word given at the right time will affect eternity positively. But a right word given to somebody and then held on and given to that person in the wrong time has lost all its power. So when God prompts you to say something, or you're prompted by God to say something to someone, okay, it's a test. Do I say it or do I not say it? And not, and not to be shameful or, or, or degrading, but if you don't say it, you're not going to be shameful. You're not gonna, the only thing you're going to lose is a potential blessing that you're going to have. One less present under the Christmas tree, so to speak. But God still loves you. And he'll give you that test again. And again. And if need be, again. Until we get to be a ripe old age of 106 and finally figure out what the test was back when we were 30. But God will rejoice. He finally got it. It took him 73 years, 76 years, but he got it. And all of heaven will rejoice. Because we're, we've all been at jobs, we've all had employers where they see the one thing we did wrong, but they don't see the 99% or the 99 things we did right. And how, we're, and how do we raise our kids? How do we raise our, our employees, employers? Same way. What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? Well, what about, hey, what's right? What did I do that was encouraging? Or what did I do that, that, that I did that I can be encouraged to keep on doing that? Because I'm not a farmer but if, or, 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 a, or, a, or a horse trainer, but if you keep on beating a horse, what's going to happen? <laughs> that's going to lose its will to live because you're just, you know, you're, you're constantly reinforcing him with negative words rather than positive words. And our words have two, our words have two avenues, words of life or words of death. And they do affect eternity. Good or bad. Good or bad. <laughs> I've, I've, I've Told us to release. I told us my son. I says, I don't, I don't, I don't say things that I haven't. Ninety-five percent of what I think about in here doesn't come out here. It goes into my heart first to, to make sure I'm not being hypocritical, critical, and and, and over criticizing. Once I've corrected myself, then I feel free that I can say that to somebody else because I've already corrected myself of what I thought of that person was doing wrong. So I'm a man of, I'm not a man of many words, but I want to, when I, when I make words come out, I want to make sure that they have the full effect and the full weight that they need. And testimony time, sometimes those words come out <laughs> in the heat of battle. Well, we've all been there. And, you know, that's okay. We're... Like I said last week, I said we, we are delivering a perfect message through an imperfect vessel. 
And even what I even what I even what I just said, I'm going to learn from, and it may be different tomorrow. What I just said about something just two seconds ago, because I'm growing and I'm learning. I've always said, if you don't if you don't learn something today, the day is lost, and you can't get that back. When I was in the restaurant business, we had a you know seat about uh, restaurants could hold 100 people, and at five o'clock there's five people in the restaurant. Well, those 95 seats have just been lost. Forever, I can't get those back. So, yeah, just always constantly learning, always constantly growing. God bless you again. <laughs> Question. Oh. Question. Anybody? Who's the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost is number th is one part of the Trinity. So we've got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit slash Holy Ghost. That's what they call it back in the in the New Testament times, and it's not really it's not really important who we call him, but who he is. Now, that's one thing we can't get our mind wrapped around. They're three in one, kind of like the oil, but within that. Unity, they all have their specific job descriptions. God the Father was the one who created this. The Son was the one who fulfilled the Father's plan. And uh, the Spirit is the one who is in us now, who is residing in us, because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, according to uh, 1 Corinthians 3. So the Spirit has his job of teaching us, comforting us, and basically growing us. But it was, what was interesting was when we were going through the book of Revelation, it said we ran across the verses about the scrolls. And the Father had the scrolls in his hand, but it says in there, there was, only, there was only one worthy to open up the scrolls. It was the Son. Because the Son was the one who went through all the trials and he was worthy to open up the scrolls. Even though God the Father created the scrolls and the Spirit of God is the one who is inside of us, the only one worthy to actually open up those scrolls is the one who walked through our trials on this earth and he passed. I, never, I had never thought about that before until I reread that thing. But that means that there's still order in heaven. Certainly the Father could have Upsert his, you know, put his foot down and said, I'm going to open them. But as crazy it is to think, he wasn't worthy to open them because he hadn't gone through the 33 years that Jesus did on this earth. Yeah, it's, so I, I'm still scratching my head on that, and I'm still thinking, but, but that's the beauty of what, of, of what God does with us. He, he is not a God of chaos, he's a God of order. And things we go through. Oh, why did God give me this? Well, don't ask that. Just just roll with it. Order. Call the order of things. And you know how how arrogant we become, thinking we can out order God. Oh God, that's not every good way. I'll I'll do it this way. I'm going to plant my bean seeds upside down rather than right side up. I'll do it a different way. No, no don't do that. <laughs> Or you know, as, or, or, or you know, the farmers plant seeds a different way, thinking it's a better way. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Dale, but you know, the, the, the seed companies tell you this is how the seed is supposed to work. This is how you plant it. They give you the directions on how to put the seed in the ground because you're the ones that had created that seed. Same thing with God. God created us, and He's planted that seed deep within the side of us, and He. We know that there's order. We know that there's order. At least I do. But how many times we'd say, no, that doesn't, that's not going to, what? That's crazy, God. I'm going to do it this way. And again, not to shame anybody or, or to be beating ourselves with, you know, with a two-way for it. So we, must just, we just missed out on blessing. We have left, we have left, we have less to give the, the Son of God when we lay our crowns on in heaven for him 
than we would have if we would have been obedient. No big deal. God still loves us. We're still okay. Our star might not be so bright as somebody else, but that's okay. God knows that. He's good, God. Even when we mess up. Did that answer the question? Oh, another question from Wendy. Well, for, from Holy Spirit, so oh, that was a question from Holy Ghost. There you go. Yeah. We good with that? Would, yeah. Okay. Well, going on. And that was the Holy Spirit to come down upon us when we believe in Christ. So for the Old Testament, um, so after Jesus died, everybody has the opportunity to be Holy Spirit come upon. Um, um, but in Old Testament, they didn't have that. It was only certain people for a certain amount of time will be anointed for the purpose and will of what God has yep. there. And that was the government, that was the, the kingdom government back then. The interesting point about I must leave so that the comforter may come. You know what else he said with that? I must leave so that you can do greater things than I have done on this earth. What did Jesus do? Raise the dead, heal the blind, gave uh, hearing to the, to the deaf, did a whole bunch of crazy stuff. But then he said, once I leave, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit so that you can do things greater than I have. What would be greater than raising the dead? Having the Holy Spirit of God you. No. It, 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 we, life seems, we, we tend to go through life so fast we don't stop and think about that stuff until it's like, oh, what is greater than raising the dead? What is greater than, than giving somebody a new leg? But it's giving them God's life in their heart. Because when he raised Lazarus from the dead, what happened 10 years later? Lazarus died. But what Lazarus got from that whole experience was he got new life that was never going to end. Bruce, I Find a way, Dale. I, I think that's really a good point uh, about what Isaac just made over there. That, you know, sometimes we, when we look at that, read that passage about that we will do greater things, we, we look at his miracles. Yeah. And I think, I think Jesus died that we all may be saved. And the way we're all going to be saved is that we share what he did. Yeah. 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 Uh, Bill Vanderbush said an interesting <coughs> few weeks ago, he said, when Jesus died on the cross, the biggest, the biggest thing that happened to us not was our salvation, but we were free from all obligations. To, we, all of our obligations were fulfilled. So what did that free us up to do? Serve God slash serve others. And that was, and that was a new way of thinking. It's like, he took away all my obligations to, to do anything. And I'm free to, you know, serve God. But we're stuck back in Israel as thinking we're still in bondage. But, but Jesus took away that bondage and now we're and now we're free, but that for me scares the you know what on me. You know what do I do with that freedom? What did Israel do with that freedom when they got out of Egypt? They wanted to go back. Because, because their bondage was known. They knew that they were going to get whipped. They knew they were going to work hard. They knew they were going to get something to eat a couple times a day. But they knew what to expect. When God releases our mind from that thinking and gives, gives us freedom to think and to serve him, that is really scary. Because now we don't know what is going to be around the corner But as far as the situation. But going around the corner, we know who's going to be there. And that's God. No matter, so you know, I've said this a few different times, no matter what happens to me now, I really don't care what happens to me now. I, I'm in a position of Job. He could lose everything. But the one thing I still have is God. And that's revolutionary because now I'm not holding on so tightly to things that I have. I'm holding on tight to somebody who I 
Love. Thank you, Dale, for that. That's it's 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 renewing our minds. Two plus two is still four. <laughs> but God puts an extra flavor to it. He makes it come alive. Same thing with God's word. We can memorize God's word. There was a, I heard a story of a lady who was in treatment, and one of her goals was to memorize the Bible. Because she thought if she could memorize the Bible, that would be the answer to all of her problems. She got to the book of Revelation, and she realized it wasn't going to do that. But she had to memorize the first 65 books of the Bible. To get to, to, to have some kind of peace within her heart. I did that for 30 years studying God's word so that I didn't have to, so I could validate my faith and move on. And God says, no, that's not right. God didn't scold me for it, he just turned me in the right direction. When I study God's word now, I study to see him, not to see an answer to my faith so I don't have to worry about anything. You don't believe that searching for an answer? No. And the answers will be there. I mean, you can, you, can look, you can look in the Bible for anything you want and you'll find it. But who is it serving? Myself or is it serving God? Dale. You know, one time I, I heard somebody say that uh, when you judge something, you can either judge it by the letter of the law or the spirit of the law. Mm -hmm. And sometimes God will ask you, you judge both, both of them. Yeah. But, uh, but always, I always looked at that and I thought, knowing Christ and the forgiveness he gives, you know, what is the spirit of the law in this situation? You know? yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he wants the law written into our hearts. Not on stone, but in our hearts. Or our heart is... A, a, but also the spirit within. Yeah. The spirit within... The, uh, Massages that law, kind of. You yeah. Know, it softens. Yeah. And it, and the and when the when the when the law is in our heart, it mas it gets massaged by the spirit of God, but it also not it doesn't change, but we change when God reveals a little more dimension to that that law. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if if you know you live by the sword, die by the sword. You know, that's a, that's an old adage. But what that means is if you and it says in Matthew seven, it says you know you judge other people. With just this little speck in their eye, but you got a big old beam in your eye that you can't, you're judging incorrectly. And really, we were never supposed to judge anyway until Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the tree of, of, of good and evil, because that was never our responsibility to judge others. Yeah. Now we have it. <laughs> and we do kind of a poor job of judging others because we judge from our experiences. And when a new, and when a new, reference points comes into our heart from heaven, then we need to change our mode of thinking before we can change somebody else's mode of thinking. Mm -hmm. Do you think, do you think uh, God wants us, you know, he talks about judging, but when he's talking about judging, he's talking about judging the truth. <coughs> you know, he's not necessarily talking about judging that person, but what, what, what is coming out of that person? And in, in reading the fruit, you can read the person. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, uh, I was reading through uh, Mark and, and the uh, story of the, of the fig tree. And it says, Jesus was far off and he saw a fig tree with leaves on it. So instantly in his mind, he said, okay, that fig tree has produced fruit. I'm hungry, I'm gonna go up and eat it. He got closer and saw that there was no fruit on the fig tree. And what did he do? He cursed it. The next day it was withered. The disciples kind of got freaked out. But what, what Jesus is saying is, I saw from my eyes afar off a tree that was producing fruit. I got closer to satisfying my physical hunger and saw that there was no fruit on the tree. And he cursed it. Israel was the same way. From, from afar off, they looked really good. They had, they had leaves on their tree. But when people got closer to, to salvation 
with the God of Israel, they found that there was no fruit on that tree, and they were deceived. So to your point, Dale, we need to, we need to our trees have to be producing fruit that is, that is appetizing to not only the physical eye, but the spiritual eye that people see. And James 3 talks about how our tongue can, you know, how, how can a tongue speak good words and bad words at the same time? It's impossible. You know, how can bitter water come out of the same well as good water? Well, <laughs> but, but they were deceived because they saw, they saw a potential for, for, for filling their heart. And it wasn't there. And Jesus got mad. And with his words, cursed that tree. And the, the, the tree obeyed the words of the, the creator. How often do we obey the words of the creator when he tells us to plant 40 acres instead of 140 acres? And that's the other point too. You, you don't know where you know. So, like we judge from our own experiences, but we don't know where that person was coming from to do what they did. Yeah. So, so then judgment becomes love and compassion rather than righteousness and truth. Hi. Oh well. They talked about that in Matthew chapter five too. That's right. So, so, we're not supposed to say the word idiot. I've been trying hard not to say it. Why don't you ask God for the solution? I had a man, had a man call me two weeks ago. I've got all my notes down for the sermon. Mind if I share it, Terry? Go right ahead. You're going to <laughs> 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 And I said, I said, you got your notes on the table, right? Yeah, but th there's no order to it. I said, Terry, here's what you do. You put your notes on the table, you put a blank piece of paper next to it, and you put a chair next to those blank piece, that blank note paper, and you sit down. Jesus is going to be sitting in that chair, and he's going to get your notes together for you. And how much of the struggle was it, Terry? It was too easy. I told you that. I was scared to death because it seemed too easy to do. Of course... You can be judged, whoever heard me talk. <laughs> maybe, maybe it wasn't that good. <laughs> but how often do we try in our own energy and our own essence to make things work when all you need to do is sit down on the table, allow yourself, yield yourself to Jesus, and just start writing. And from that experience now, not only had it, but in the heart, when Terry runs in that situation again, he will rely not on his own power, but Jesus has the power to get through. And his, his plans work out a whole lot better than ours. Because he does see what's going to happen. We only see what's in front of our face. And we, and we, try, and, and we try with such a good heart to, to do the right thing. And a lot of times it blows up in our face. What you were talking about earlier, just about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And just <coughs> thinking about it, that Jesus in the New Testament, when he was here and went through everything that he did, died, rose, instructed us, gave us the Holy Spirit, we're halfway to follow. I look back into the Old Testament and Adam and Eve and then the other Bible characters that were there uh, Noah and Abraham and Moses this really had to come from Adam when he lived and shared and carried on to his kids and you, you look at Jesus wasn't there and the Holy Spirit wasn't there. So that was a direct line from God to Adam and then to these other people. 
So he mentioned Adam, he mentioned Noah, Moses, Abraham. Those were, well, those were all people that God tried to covenant with. They tried to make he tried to make a covenant with with Adam. He tried to make a covenant with, with Moses. He tried to make a covenant with Abraham and David. Those failed miserably because they were with the man who was sinful. He made a covenant with Jesus. Jesus fulfilled that covenant. And the other interesting note is, you know, we say that the Old Testament was not, the people were, were intermittently filled with the Holy Spirit because that was the, that was the government back then. Think of it this way: when Jesus was on this earth, he was never, ever, ever without the filling of the Holy Spirit, except for three hours. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, the Father, my God, the Spirit, why have you forsaken me? When he was on the cross, they forsook him because he was taking on the sin of our world. And they could not have company with sin. But Jesus was never without the Holy Spirit. And Jesus was a son of man. And now we have the opportunity to never be without the filling of the Holy Spirit. We turn the switch off numerous times. Because we don't like, don't know, don't know, you know, we don't like where we're going. But he, he's waiting there for us. You know, I heard the other day on the radio. Uh oh, radio, not good, Dave. AM side. Oh, AM side, yeah, too. Oh, boy. Five talks about how Adam sinned, and then that's how the sin was carried on to you and I. Which is interesting to know because how was Jesus conceived? He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Adam and Eve were created by God and were sinless until they chose otherwise. Jesus had the same opportunities as Adam and Eve did. But he chose the Father's will over his own will. A lot of times we don't we don't choose the Father's will because we don't know what the Father wants from us. Go ahead, Wendy. Okay. So I was thinking about okay back so Holy Spirit. So being a recovered drug addict and, and a non believer, mm -hmm. um, I didn't have to change uh, God said, come as you are. Yep. Come as you are. Seek him. So I sought him through a 12-step program. Um, and then when I accepted him as my higher power and asked Jesus into my life, that's when the change happened. Mm -hmm. That's when the fruits of the Spirit, yeah, that's when the fruits started to to bloom. You know, And it's practice every day. Because practicing patience it's a reoccurring practice every yeah. day. But to do that, but to also to know, um, you know, I couldn't do this change on my own. Like, I, I could not change anything on my own. Like, my anger is gone. I mean, that was the first thing he took yeah. when I, I laid it at his feet, because I had to go before anything else. And he took the, the need to my want of my addiction, yeah. of the hard addiction, like the ones that was gonna about to kill me. Sure. Um, but but I, I just have to reiterate that it's like comfortable. I didn't have to clean up. I didn't have to dress up. I didn't have to change nothing. I just came as I was, this hot mess of a human, and and and, and receive it, <coughs> believe it, and receive it, and, and now to you know pass that <coughs> on to others. Because for some people, especially non-believers, it can be hard to. So I get it. But he changed everything. Like, God changed everything. And he could only change, he could only make the changes within. When when God changes something, it's, it's permanent. Mm -hmm. 
And you said, you know, I was a hot mess and I came to God. But you were still created in God's image. And he still longs to have fellowship with you. Yeah. And that's one of the things we have to, a big roadblock in our mind, even, even after we're saved. Oh, God doesn't want me because I just screwed up. Baloney. Yeah. Let A. She opened her heart to faith. Or she opened her faith. Or she opened her heart to faith in the unknown. Yeah. She had faith in the unknown that whatever was going to happen was from God and would impact her life. Because we are created in God's image, we have the DNA of God in our heart. And we and there is that longing to get back to, to sit in the Father's lap. And this world has a lot to offer to keep us away from that. But once you've tasted God's goodness, you're never gonna you're never gonna want to taste anything else again. Good. Add anything to that? You good? You're good. Yeah. You're great. Um, thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're just not all good, we're great. But it's a it's a journey. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna fall and skin our knees. We're gonna mess up. But the 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 real mess up is if we don't learn from what we messed up. Because if we keep on doing the same thing over and over and over and over again, hoping it changes. That's the definition of insanity. insanity. Hey, we all got that, don't we? <laughs> but in order, but in order to change that line of thinking, we have to give something up, which is our, our. We need to yield our will. Thank you, Dave, to the Holy Spirit. Now, anybody who's driven a truck or anything or a car, a yield sign means slow down, look both ways. And then give her, give her to get going again. Mm -hmm. It's not a stop sign. We never really want to stop unless there's cars coming. But yield, we just need to yield. We're still moving. We're just going to yield, look both ways, and then go. And then go. too buff and say, this is just stupid what we did back in the 40s, the 20s. Or, you know, it's like, what are, what are we thinking? But yet, you know, Ecclesiastes says there's a time of peace, there's a time of war. Revelation, we're getting into it where, you know, a third of the earth was wiped out. It just, you know, it's just like, like I said, boy, it just it changed our hearts. I got real close to God when I had diagnosed with cancer. All my fellowship was, I, I, I was, you know, 24 7 with them. But then cancer got healed and just kind of just slowly get back into the life's world's routine. Where'd God go? Well, God's always been there. Just Paul didn't know where God was at. And it's, it's, a, it's a bad question when, when God says to Adam, Adam, where are you at? Well, you, didn't, you think God didn't know where Adam was at? <laughs> Adam, God knew where Adam was at. Adam didn't know where Adam was at. And God was asking Adam, where are you at? <laughs> and he said, well, I'm, I'm hiding because I was naked. And I sewed my fig leaves together. 
to cover himself, which was an expendable commodity. And God says, I'm going to fill you with a commodity that cost a life, and I clothe you with goatskin. That's how much God cares for us. He wants to, he wants to change to be permanent. Like it was. And every day we can every day we can go through those permanent changes if we allow it. <coughs> because we're always in the state of renovation. And who's ever renovated an old house? Looks good on the outside, but soon you turn to the walls. <laughs> what were these guys thinking? What this like just hanging here? So yeah. you know, yeah. a two week project turns into two months or three years, or whatever. Yeah. yeah, but that's 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 who we are. We're old houses that God has renovated. It's good. It's perfect. But then we gotta be in line with the renovation too. We have to allow we have to allow the general contractor to swing a hammer to wipe out a wall that we don't need that we thought we needed. <laughs> Dave. <laughs> yeah, and then he takes it down. Then what do we do? We, we quit, hoist it back up. Anything else? We're over four three. Uh huh. I just said we're over four plan now. <laughs> <laughs> and we and we need to because what is, and the Jesus talked about that too. He said, I I I went and exercised a demon out of somebody's house. The house was clean. But what happened? The dude that he just kicked out, the demon he just kicked out, brought back seven more that were more powerful than he was and inhabited the house because the house was still clean. Jesus cleaned the house, but we didn't furnish it. And when we didn't furnish it with God's word and obedience to God's kingdom and his, and his, and his plan, seven more came back in Stronger than the one he kicked out, because <coughs> there's the room was the house was clean and moved, room to move around. <laughs> so, anything else? We don't want to hold you up too much longer, and we have Fourth of July parties to celebrate. Oh. <laughs> we celebrated Fourth of July to what? Eleven o'clock last night. Boom, oh, boom, 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 boom. boom, boom, boom. <laughs> and we weren't, we weren't on. <laughs> <laughs> which, 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 you know, you can think of that as a negative way, but how did God speak to Israel? With thunders. Ah, so next time a boom goes off, oh, what are you trying to say to me, God? It's all how we perceive things. And I've often said this, this is, you know, my, you know, my cancer didn't change. I still had cancer, but my perception, perspective to that change, which made a world of difference. It didn't take away the cancer, it just, my perspective changed to the fact that God has got it all in control. And again, preachers that get up here, teachers, that's our ideal that we shoot for. Who never think that we have it, all the answers. I'm digging just as much as you guys are on words. In fact, I just, I was making preparation for this week for an actual message and looked up the word commit in Hebrew. I looked up and said, this can't be right. You know, what it, you know what it meant? Commit. Definition? To roll over. <laughs> what in the world? <laughs> well, like, or to roll together. Well, <laughs> To roll together, I'm thinking, what in the world are you doing, me, God? This isn't even close to what I think commit means. But this is what it meant. I even Googled it last night or this morning. There's got to be there's got to there's got to be a different answer than that. Because that answer doesn't make any sense. But to roll together, roll together all of our energies to commit to God. That's what it meant. But my my logical thinking that doesn't make any sense. Throw it away. It didn't. It didn't leave. All right, all right, all right, I'll keep on looking. All of a sudden, roll things together. All of them commit them to God. So I'll take a breath. And take a breath and breathe in God. This is where it's at. 
He's, he's every breath that you take. And when you're having a bad day, just breathe. Nobody's ever had a bad day in here, have they? <laughs> take off your shoes and start counting toes. Anyway, any other questions? Terry, go. Thank you for reminding me, Terry. What? Hey, Terry, well, Mike, what's a good wife for except to remind you that you're getting a, a year older? Right, it's awesome, isn't it? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Michael. Celebrate life, Mike. Thank you. Yes. That's, that's what we're here to do is celebrate life. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 If you guys need any prayer, come on up. If not, you're dismissed. The teacher has dismissed class.